We are talking about being extraordinary. That's the extraordinary strength that Zach displays every time that he moves this podium. This podium, you know, I weighted it and uh, it's about 60 pounds. And uh, so, yeah, extraordinary strength, extraordinary music talent that we have enjoyed this morning. Thank you, ladies, so much. <laughs> Wonderful. We want to be extraordinary people for God. That's what we want to do. And I want to talk a little bit about that today. Um, everybody wants to do better in life. We all do, right? You want your kids to be excellent, to excel in their schoolwork. You want to excel at your job. You want to excel in all of the things that you do. You know, we go out there and we play a game of volleyball or a, or a softball, and we want to excel. We want to be better than the other team. I mean, we are just competitive by nature as human beings, and we want to succeed in everything that we do. One of the areas that uh, often gets neglected is spiritual. Are we extraordinary spiritual? Do we have a relationship with God that is um, meaningful, that is real? Do you know that God is involved in your life? Has God been good to you? Or do we just go through the motions as so many Christians often do? So I want to talk about that. In the Bible, there is one text, and this is the text that I want to use today, that I find uh, both uh, intriguing and interesting and sad all at the same time. And this one is found in Ecclesiastes 9.10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead where you're going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. And this to me is sad because it tells us that we are, that our life is going to end and the closer you come to that point in life where you realize that you only have so many years left, then you start questioning your life and questioning the things that you have done. You know, at this point in my life, personally, I can talk from my own experience, I turned 59 last year in October, and I am thinking, now I don't want to depress anybody who is older than me, by saying this, and I'm thinking, I can actually figure out pretty much how many weeks I have left on this earth. Let's say I live another 10 years, right? That's 520 weeks. When you're 30 years old, you don't think about it, do you? You're just thinking, oh yeah, I have a whole life ahead of me. I'm going to do all of these wonderful, crazy things, you know. I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be extraordinary. And then, you, you know, as you get older and older and older, you start realizing that your time on this earth is very limited and short and temporary. And God says here in this verse, therefore, whatever you do, whatever your, hands, your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. And I am wondering if we have been following God with all of our might. Or if we have just kind of been coasting along. And that's what I want to talk about today. Before we go there, I want to show you two extraordinary individuals that uh, have lived on this planet. And obviously the first one is Einstein. You all have uh, heard of him. Everybody knows who Einstein was, right? I mean, if there was a man who was an extraordinary individual, that was him. And then when you look at his life, I found out online, obviously, that he died uh, at the age of 76 in 1955. He had an aneurysm, heart aneurysm, and he died. And then they put, you know, they, they uh, I, th I believe that they, he wasn't buried, that they burned his body. And I'm not sure where his ashes are, but now all that is left of him is a monument somewhere in the United States, you know, and people can go over there and take pictures next to his monument. And all of his accomplishments and extraordinary achievements came to an end 
at that point when his heart gave up. It all came to an end. That was it. There was no more, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. That was it. And then the next one is Tesla. Nikola Tesla, you all heard of him too. And on January 7, 1943, he died alone at the age of 86 in a room 3327 of a New York hotel. And he was found by a maid who came to made up, make up his room two days after he died. He put the sign, do not disturb. And she finally ignored it and walked into the room and found him dead there. And all of his tremendous achievements, inventions, patents, it all stopped at that point. It all ended. And we lost him and there was no, you know, he's not around anymore. And in, uh, after World War II in 1950s, his ashes were taken back to Serbia, Belgrade, and they are now contained in a museum over there. And you can see the picture of where his ashes are now. And that's all that happened to a human being. He's gone. You can read about him in, in the books, and we can say he was an extraordinary human being, but he's gone. Everything stopped. When is that moment going to come for you and I? It will. As I was coming in, Richard, you told me about a famous climber who died today, right? Yesterday, Jim, Jim Bridwell. And I just looked him up online, and sure enough, you told me the truth. He was one of the most famous climbers in the world, climbed all of these big mountains, and yesterday he's gone. Lee, you were baptized today. And today your niece is in the hospital. And your brother Harold is over there. And we don't know if she's going to live through day. And she's what, 30 some years old? 27 years old. And her, you know, her condition, her liver. And we are praying for her as a church. And we are praying for many others. But this is, this is the fate of all, everybody who is born on this planet. So, you can choose to be extraordinary soccer player or a basketball player or a professor or a musician or a scientist. And all of that is good. But one thing that we ought to choose to be extraordinary in more than anything else is our spiritual life. And that's what I want to talk about. And how do you do that? How do you achieve that? One of the, one of the ways, and I want to give you seven steps here on how we can achieve it. And the first one is to choose redemptive action. And I want to talk a little bit about it. We as Christians need to understand that in every situation that we face, we can choose a redemptive action. You can choose to, in other words, to make that situation a little bit better than it was when we encountered it. We are living in a world today that is full of hate, right? More than any time ever in the United States, for example, we have so much hate and so much anger and so much is political and so much is, you know, just people are... Where does it come from? comes from Satan. How do you act against it? By connecting to God. How do you deal when somebody is attacking you? How do you handle it? How do you handle when somebody is being unjust towards you? What do you do when somebody is doing wrong to you? You can choose in every one of those situations you can choose a redemptive response. In other words, I'm going to make this situation a little bit better. I'm going to ask God to use me for the good of others. So when you're encountering these situations, these problems, these difficulties, life that's coming at us, do you ask God to help you to act for the good of others? Or do you just think about yourself? Or are you just offended by what people are saying to you? 
Do you invite God to help you redeem the situation? You know, that's what we were made for. God made us to be spiritual beings. He made us to make this world a better place. He made us to bring redemption and to bring salvation and to bring grace and to bring love into this world. So in every situation, you can choose how you're going to act. It can be with your wife. It can be with your boss. It can be on the street. It can be when you're shopping. It can be when you're discussing politics with somebody who doesn't agree with you. But in every situation, you can choose to be angry or you can choose to be redemptive. You can choose to be loving. You can choose to be the opposite of what this world is expecting of you. And as Christians, I think that's what we ought to do. We ought to choose to act the way Jesus would act. By looking to redeem the situation, number three, you are bringing hope to people. You see, so many people are out there struggling with problems, with life. So many people out there are not expecting anybody to care. When I was in the seminary, one year, they said, uh, you guys are going to, the whole class is going to go to Chicago and you're going to participate in the evangelistic meetings. And the professor was Russell Burrell, who I think is, a, is known in Seventh-day Adventist circles as one of the evangelists and the founder, you know, one of the big founders of the evangelistic movements in the Adventist church. And we went over there to Chicago and I stayed at my house with my mother, you know, she lived in Chicago. And we went to this one church where we were supposed to do the uh, two months of evangelistic meetings. So I'm living with my mother in the basement. I'm trying to work at the same time in Chicago. I, got, I always had a job when I was in Chicago. I'm trying to work to make enough money for the tuition and everything else. And then I'm spending literally the whole day giving Bible studies and going house to house, door to door, following up on all of these leads to work with these people, give them Bible studies so that they could be baptized. And I tell you, after about a month of that, I just got so sick and tired of just the whole thing because it was get, getting to me. The workload was getting to me. People were getting to me. You know, it was just intense. And you could see that on my face. You could see that in my demeanor. You could see that in my attitude. And finally, you know, one day, Russell and another guy who were in charge of this, they called me in and they said, Gordon, we want to talk to you. Come to the office, you know. So I went to the office and, they, and I sat down. And I kind of knew what they wanted to talk about. But they said, uh, what's going on? Can we help you some way? And you know what? Just because somebody asked, just because somebody showed a little bit of care, my whole demeanor just turned around. I knew now that these guys cared for me. They cared about my well-being. They brought redemption into my life. You see, they brought something good in my life. They brought hope into my life, you know. And by doing that, my whole attitude changed. And I was able to go out and finish that whole experience with energy and strength and power. Because somebody brought a little bit of redemption and a little bit of hope into my life. And you know what? Ever since that day, I'm always asking myself, have I done the same for somebody else? When was the last time you brought a little bit of hope into somebody's life? When was the last time that by your words and by your actions and by your kindness, you helped somebody to get over the hump that they were facing in their own life? See, that's what it means to choose redemptive action. Look, by looking to redeem the situation, you are bringing hope into person's life. And then number four, ask God to help you see things from his perspective. That's also very important. 
Because sometimes we only look at ourselves. Sometimes we only look at our own problem. We don't see the problems that other people have. We don't see how God looks at them and how he sees their difficulties and their trials. And we sometimes just label them as a bad person, you know, because they have done such and such. And, and you know, there is a lot of bad things out there in this world. We have this young man that just killed 17 kids in, uh, in Florida shooting. And when you look at that kid, you know, you say, evil person. And when you look at his actions and when you look at his behavior and the things he posted online and so on, you see that there is something that caused all of that bad behavior. And when you look at all of his history, and if we were able to look at him the way God sees him, what would we see? Would we see somebody who is troubled and broken and sick? Or would we just say, oh, this is a bad person, fry him? You know. That's what it means to ask God when we, you know, when you have a confrontation, when you have a situation, when you have a difficulty with somebody, ask God to help you see that person through his eyes. And when you do that, then you're able to bring a little bit of redemption into their life because you begin to understand who they are. That's what it means to me to become an extraordinary person. Another point is uh, to develop reconciling relationships. Be willing to reach out to other people, despite whether you like them or not. Sometimes we want to stay away from the people we don't like. Sometimes we want to stay away from those who hurt our feelings. But what if you're willing to reach out to the people despite whether or not you like them and allow God's love to flow through you to them? What would happen then? So yeah, you can shy away from people you don't like. You can badmouth them behind their back, or to their face. You can attack them in some way. Or you can say, you know what, I'm going to develop a reconciling relationship with that person. How? By asking God that, my, that his love works through me on that person. Sometimes you just can't do it, but God can do it. Sometimes you, just, you and I, we don't have the capacity to love somebody who hates us. But Jesus does. He had that capacity to love people who hated him. So ask God that his love flow, flows through you, number one. And then, number two, perform acts of love. It's not just enough to say to people, oh, I love you. Or I'm going to, you know, be nice to you. I mean, we also have to perform the actual acts of love. And sometimes that costs not just money, but our pride. Sometimes it costs, you know, because why should I do this? And God says, you do it because I did it for you. You do it because Jesus did it for you. That's what it's all about. That's, that's about becoming an extraordinary spiritual person by performing acts of love, not just talking about it. And number three... Overcoming hatred with love. And when you do that, when you try to overcome hatred with love, you can, you can actually reconcile the relationships. I have never seen where hatred overcomes love. When you love, you overcome. Love is the most powerful weapon. And love is. Why do we follow Jesus? Why? Because deep down you know that he loves you. Deep down, you know, even if you don't understand the plan of salvation, even if you don't understand or have a hard time understanding the whole concept of Jesus dying on the cross for you, deep down when you read the, the New Testament and when you read the account of Jesus' love, life, you realize that he loves you. And that's why we follow him. Love overcomes everything. We cannot do this on our own. 
we need Jesus. We need God for, to be able to do that. In order to be extraordinary, you need to have extraordinary love. love. You know, what are we going to be? This is 2018. 21st century is well on its way. Right? Here we are. The country is literally falling apart, I believe. You know, on, on all kinds of levels. Where are we going from here? What are we going to? Where, which camp are we going to fall into? Left? Right? Which camp? I say the camp of God. The camp of Jesus. I say we demonstrate the love the world is so hungry for. Jesus says, do good to those who hate you. And be kind to those who persecute you. And if your enemy is hungry, give him food. And if your enemy is thirsty, give him water. It's easy to hate. You know, I believe that what's going on in the world today, not just in the United States, but you have in uh, Burma, you have the major ethnic cleansing over there that's happening right now just because one ethnic group is pushing the other ethnic group out of that land. Two million people are affected. We have war still going on in Syria. We have major problems with Palestinians and Israelis. And all over Africa, you know, wars. China is rising up to become a dominant power in the world in South Asia and in South China. China. See, I mean, you have all of these potentials for tremendous conflicts. And everybody is operating on the basis of me, 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 and I hate everybody else. We still have the war in Ukraine, in Russia, and it can blow up any time in the Balkans again, where I come from, former Yugoslavia. That's the world we are living in. So what are we going to do? Where are we going to go as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists? Are we just going to preach the, the third angel's message? Are we just going to uh, preach about the benefits of vegetarian lifestyle? Or are we going to live the life that Jesus lived? What are we going to do? What's the most important here? I think the most important thing that we can do is do what Jesus did, is to bring love into this world of hate. Introduce love Everywhere you go, every person you come into contact with, they need to realize that you love them and that you care for them. Number three, encourage others to seek spiritual restoration. Do we remember that every time we come into contact with people that we actually represent Jesus Christ? You are his representative. I sometimes become ashamed of myself if I misbehave. You know, sometimes I get the notion to get mad at somebody because some, they did something to me, maybe on the road, maybe in the store, maybe at work. You know, just because I'm a pastor, it doesn't mean that we don't have problems at work. We sometimes do with our bosses, with our colleagues, you know. And sometimes you get this notion that you're going to tell them how it is. Right? <laughs> and then I have to remember, you know what? He represents Jesus. You can't just go out there and shoot your mouth off and get angry at people. You represent Jesus. You got to be careful. So, remember that in all of our interactions, we do represent Jesus. And do we do our best to represent him? You see? Do we show people that Christ is living in us and that he works in your life? Can people see that? And I keep harping on this too. You know, people don't want to go to church because they don't see the works of Jesus in the church members and in the church pastors and in the church leadership. 
You know, so we talk about evangelism and spending money on meetings and this and that, when in fact, this is all we really need to do. People need to see that Jesus Christ is working in your life. If they don't see that, why would they want to come to church? What, just, just the theoretical knowledge? I mean, there is a lot of theoretical knowledge out there, and we as Seventh-day Adventists have more knowledge than anybody else. But do we have more Jesus than anybody else? Do we have more, more good works? Do we have more being nice than everybody else? You see? That's what the world wants to see. The world wants to see that those who follow Jesus are real. That Jesus is real. Randy, I'm thinking about you. You're sitting all the way in the back. You know, as you're taking Bible studies and you're ready for a baptism, you know, and, how, and I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot, but nobody knows who you are right now because I'm not asking you to stand up. But, uh, you know, I'm talking to Randy and he says, I'm, I'm studying the Bible and I'm finding out that I need to live my life a little bit different. So what happens to all of your friends? What happens to the people that you used to run with? What happens to the people that you used to drink with? That you used to party with? What happens? They drop off. They don't want to hang around with you. But you know what else is going to happen? One or two of them is going to see, Thomas, you too, is going to see that God is working in your life. They'll see a change from somebody who used to party and have fun and go crazy to somebody who's given their life to Jesus. Can people see that God is working in your life? And then number two, are you encouraging them to allow Jesus Christ to also work in their life? You see? Are you encouraging them? Are you saying, hey, look, I used to live this way, but I'm not anymore. And I'm not because Jesus has helped me to overcome. That's what it means to be extraordinary, spiritually. Fulfilling your destiny, to become really extraordinary in this life, you need to also invite God to use you fully. Invite God to do with you whatever he wants to do. Invite God to realize his plans in your life. How often do we do that? Or do we just choose our own course, our own path, our own direction? I want to invite you today, regardless of how old you are, to ask God to help you to fulfill your destiny, your purpose what you were originally meant for. Some of you may say, I'm too old. My life has passed. I've lived a long life and I, now it's too late for God to, de- to finish his purpose in me. So I'm going to respond to you and I'm going to tell you. God can do in a week more than a human being can do in a lifetime. God can do through your life more in a day than you could do in your own power in your whole life. So it's never too late to ask God to help you fulfill the plan and the destiny that he has had for you since before you were born. That's what God can do for each one of us. So, are you going to be faithful to God? That's, you know, we we consider success in this world money, power, those kinds of things, material things. God considers it a success if we are living a faithful life. Can you do that? Can you ask God to be faithful? Faithful to your destiny. Faithful in your approach to him. Number two, don't seek recognition Seek to influence people for Jesus. When was the last time you and I prayed 
that God would lead us into the path of another human being who needs to encounter Jesus. Today, you know, when we go out there and do the street beat, you may encounter somebody that needs Jesus. Tonight, today, this afternoon, when you go home, you may have somebody in your very family who needs to encounter Jesus. Maybe your son, maybe your daughter, maybe your parents, maybe your neighbor. Somebody, you see. So are you asking God to help you influence that, those people for Jesus? Because that's your destiny, you see. Our destiny, remember, our destiny is to bring fruit. Our destiny is to be fruitful. In other words, to bring other people into, the, into God's kingdom. And God wants to use you for that. But you have to ask. You have to seek to influence people for God. Number three, as you are doing this, as you are trying to fulfill your destiny, offer both your weaknesses and your strengths to God. When was the last time we did that? It's easy to offer our strengths to God. You know, I'm strong in this area and I'm going to help out. What about weaknesses? How many of us have weaknesses? Anybody? We all do, right? God wants us to offer those weaknesses to Him. Number, let's see. I forget which number, but anyways. Five. Envision the future. That's my weakness. Boy, I have a lot of weaknesses. <laughs> Envision the future. <laughs> Ask God to give you a vision for your life. Sometimes we don't know what that vision is, right? Sometimes we don't know what to do. I talk to people all the time and they say, I don't know what to do. I don't know which major to take in school. I don't know if I should... Ephraim, I don't know if I should go to San Antonio or stay in Denver. I think the Lord is telling you right now to stay in Denver. <laughs> there is family here, friends. Kids have their friends, you know. I'm making a big pitch here right now, folks, because he, they want to move and I want them to stay here, you see. But you know what? Don't ask me. Ask God to give you vision for what you need to do. Do I really need to go or do I need to stay? What do I do with my life at this point? If you ask God for that, to give you that vision, what he wants your life to look like, he will do that. He will show you that. Now, once you receive that vision, vision has the ability to do a couple of things for you. And one of the most important one is that vision will focus you away from the distractions of your life. How many of you here are distracted with life? So many things, right? You got work, you got bills, you got wife, you got husband, you got kids, you got second job, you got all kinds of stuff coming at us constantly. You know, you pull out this thing, you know, and there is millions of pieces of information coming at you and you're trying to deal with all of that. Those are all distractions. What if God clearly spoke to you and said, this is what I want you to do? What if you knew what your vision was. That would eliminate all of the distractions. You would know exactly where you needed to go. You would know exactly what you needed to do. Until you're able to focus on that one thing, you're going to be distracted for the rest of your life. I'm focused on bringing the gospel to this community here in Denver. That's what I'm focused on. And that's what I hope that this church is focused on. So, Miller, did you say that tomorrow our television program starts? We are doing that. Because we want our neighbors to hear 
the gospel message from the Arvada Seventh-day Adventist Church. Not from some other big entity out of Washington, D.C., but from here, locally. Recorded right here on this stage. And the same with our radio program. The same with our food bank ministry that we have here in this church that you support. Street beat that's going out there today to feed the homeless. The same with our mission trip that we're going to take to Indonesia this summer in July and go build a kitchen in this school that's, uh, that doesn't have money for anything. The same with our medical ministry van that uh, we are almost ready to purchase here and provide medical care to the homeless community here in Denver. How many churches do you have doing that? So we want to preach the gospel. That's what I'm focusing on. That's what my life is all about. Preach the gospel and preach some more gospel. And talk to people about Jesus. Every person that I come into contact with. And I need your help for that. You know, we can't do this uh, just me and Milos and Jim Becker and a few others. We have some teachers downstairs and we have musicians. But we need everybody's help. What would happen if every person in this room today would go out there and ask God that his power works through you into somebody else's life? What would happen to the Adventist movement if that were the case? If instead of waiting for some evangelist to do our work, if we did the work, ourselves. This life is so short. People with money die as, just as effectively as the one who are poor. What are you going to leave behind? What's your life going to say about you when you're done? What's God going to say about you when it's all done? Is God going to say, oh yeah, you were a good carpenter, you were a good driver, truck driver, you were a good doctor. What's God going to say about you? What, if God had to give you a report about your life right now, what would be in it? When I was in college, before we went into seminary, they made us, and I re just resisted this for the longest, and finally I couldn't do it anymore, but they made us take this psychological test, you know, and we, it was a whole day thing, you know, where we went through this whole thing, you know, of, of answering questions about how we felt about such and this and whatever, you know, and by the time it was all done, the computer generated this huge report for me, I still have it. 40 years later, I still have it in one of my boxes, you know. And when I first started reading it, you know, it was amazing how accurate it was about who I was and whether or not I was going to be able to be a good pastor one day. They wanted us all to go through that so that we could decide whether we wanted to continue with our career as pastors or not. And I looked at it. It was accurate. It's still accurate to this day, you know, 40 years later. And I wonder if God would have to put together a little report on my life right now, what would be in it? What would he say about me? If he had to do a report for you and, and nobody else could read it, just you, he just did a, a, a nice five-page report for you and gave it to you, what would be in it? What do you think God would put in? What would you read about yourself? So vision will focus you away from your distractions. Vision will motivate you to take redemptive action in the world. And vision must be big enough, big enough, too big for you. It must be so big that you need God to fulfill it. In this church, all the things we want to do, we definitely need God.
because without God, it's not going to happen. Without God, we do not have enough resources, we do not have enough intelligence, we do not have enough money, we do not have enough anything without God. So all of my plans and everything that we are trying to do here at this church, we desperately need God's help. But we also need you. We also need you to be extraordinary in your lives. We don't need you to be average. Nobody needs average. Nobody needs mediocre. Mediocre and average is, is not good. Everybody needs extraordinary. God needs extraordinary people. Jesus needs extraordinary people. Are you going to be one of those or are you not? That's what I'm asking you today. And the good news is, yes, yes, of course you can be extraordinary. God says, whatever you put your hands on, do it with all of your might. Now, also, we have to get our priorities straight if we are going to be extraordinary. The first priority needs to be that we need to, need to have a nurturing, close, dynamic, vibrant connection to God. If you don't have that, you're like a plant that hasn't been watered for three weeks. And you've seen how that looks, right? So, that's number one. That's number one. To have a nurturing relationship with God. That relationship can work if three things happen. Number one, you love yourself. Why? Because God loves you. How many people here in this room do not love themselves? How many people in this room treat themselves as a second class citizen? How many people in this room blame themselves over and over again for some of the things that we've done in the past? I wasn't expecting you to raise your hands, but... You see, we have that in our, it's built in. Satan comes in and he says, you're not good. You're a bad person. And then if you're bad, then you act bad. If I'm a bad person and, and if I accept this notion that I am bad and evil, then it's easier for me to hate somebody. It's easier for me to be mean. It's easier for me to be evil if I already blame myself for all of the bad things that I have done. If I don't love myself, then it's easy for me to hate myself and to hate people around me. So God is looking at you and I and he's saying, how come you don't love yourself when I love you? If I forgive you and if I accept you, And if I hold you in my arms, gently like a baby, and if I love you despite all of your, if I don't see those faults, why do you? I want you to know and understand that Jesus loves you. And as a result, you ought to love yourself. And then love other people by living in significant relationships with them and we definitely do not do enough of that instead of the word significant relationships we can use the words superficial relationships why because we don't have time for other people we are too busy and self-obsessed and self-absorbed we would rather go home and sit in our living room and watch our favorite movie. Then go listen to somebody's problems. We would rather go and do our own thing. Than get involved intimately in somebody else's life. 
And I want to invite you today to develop, if you don't have already, to develop a few significant relationships with people where you can demonstrate and express your love to them in a significant and meaningful way. You know, and maybe if you are a... Maybe if you're a lawyer or a doctor, maybe you ought to have a relationship with somebody who is driving a truck for a living. You get my drift here? And then, number three, make a commitment to serve the world around you. That's what it means to get our priorities straight. I want us to serve the world around us, folks. All of the things that we are doing and more. I'm not satisfied with the food bank and the street wheat and the mission trip and the medical van. I want us to do more. Maybe one of you sitting here in this room right now has a burden on your heart to do a ministry for God. Maybe all of your life you had this notion in your heart. You know, if I could, I would like to do such and such for God. And maybe you suppressed it a little bit and shelled it Put it in a drawer somewhere because life got distracted. And I want you to pull it out of that drawer. Bring it down off of that shelf. I want to tell you, you know what? In this church you can do ministry if you want to. If you have an idea of how to make this world a better place. If you have an idea for a ministry that can make a difference in this community then by all means, let's do it. Let's put it together. Let's organize. Let's plan it. There are, you know, there, if God had put, it in your, had put it in your heart, he will also bring people to surround you with uh, that will be a team to do it. Years ago, we had a notion to do an English class for people who did not speak English in this church. We had a notion to do a soccer camp in the summer months here at our soccer field behind the church for the kids whose parents go to work and they are left all alone all summer long here in the, in the houses around us. We had all kinds of ideas and all kinds of notions what we could do for God. But in order for any of that to happen, you need to be an extraordinary person. Having an extraordinary relationship with God. And having a commitment to serve the world around you. And lastly, you know, if we are going to be extraordinary, we need to set goals. I'm planning to ride us uh, uh, in June. I'm going on this uh, century ride with a bicycle, 100 miles. And in order to accomplish that, I need to have goals. You know, how many miles I'm going to ride on my bike every week between now and then. This is the first Sunday in June. By the way, if any of you want to join me, you're welcome. I'm going to give you the information in the website and we can all go together down there to Castle Rock and do a 100-mile ride. You can do a 60-mile ride if you don't want to do 100. But if you're doing something like that, you need to have goals because when you get there, you cannot just show up and get on a bike. You have to be in a little bit of a shape, you know. So goals are important for everything. So we need to set goals also in our spiritual life. You know, specific goals in these five areas that I want to mention to you. Number one is relationship with God. And we talk about it. Relationship with God. Set a specific goal. About the time that you're going to spend with God. About the ministry that you are going to be involved with. And then when you set these goals, make a commitment to stick with it for the next year. You see? That's number one. Number two, 
personal growth? Are you learning more about the Bible? Are you learning more about Jesus? There are so many advances now in theological knowledge, science, archaeology. Books are being written, New Testament, Old Testament. How much of any of that are you studying? Or are you just happy with the knowledge that you have received prior to your baptism? The knowledge out there is tremendous when it comes to the Bible and to the Word of God and to the Scriptures. Are you growing personally? You know, so set the personal growth. You know, one of my goals this year, I never read this version of the Bible, and this is the Living Bible. I always read King James and NIV and all of those other ones. This year I want to finish reading this Bible in the, in the simple, simplest language that, that's out there. English language. So I'm going to read the Bible, whole Bible, from one end to the other this year. That's my goal, one of my goals. Why not set the goal to do something like that? Zach is going to read the Bible in the Greek language this year, right? Gone through by half. Okay, so everybody has, you know, to learn something. Find a seminar. Grow spiritually. Family. What are your goals for your family? For your kids. How much more are your kids going to know Jesus by the end of this year? Or will they? What are you going to teach them about? How much quality time are you going to spend with each other? How much time are you going to spend with God? What are the things that your family is going to do for the cause of God? You see? And then obviously there is career and again, community and the world, in your career, you can serve God as well. You know, it's not just about money. It's not just about savings. It's not just about putting stuff away for the rainy day. It's also about making a difference in the lives of your co-workers, in the people that you associate with on a daily basis. What's your spiritual goal for your work, for your career? Can you brighten somebody's life with the presence of Jesus through your own behavior at your workplace and in your career. People that you work with, if you didn't tell them anything about yourself, would they know that you're a seven-day Adventist? Would they know that you're a Christian? And sometimes it's not good to tell either. You know what I mean? <laughs> because, you know, if you tell them who you are and then you don't live up to it, they will judge you harshly. So be sure that you speak to people through your actions, not through your words. And finally, you know, <clears throat> making ourselves accountable to God. When that day comes that we talked about, that came for Einstein and Tesla, and it's going to come for each one of us, and when the life is close to its end, the only person you're going to be accountable to is God. Why not say to God today, you know what, I want to be an extraordinary person. I want to follow Jesus in a special way. I want to receive the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. Why not say that today? I want to be a different, better person. I want to be a person that projects and radiates love into this cold, hateful world. How many of you are interested in doing that? I'm just curious. Now you can raise your hand. Okay. So let's do that together. Let's make a commitment to God that we are going to try our best to be extraordinary people. So I'm going to ask you to come up. Let's have a prayer together as we often do here in this church. If that's what you want in your life, come on forward and we'll have a prayer. I also want to pray a leave for your niece. 
today and for other people who are sick and struggling. You can also join us by just standing where you are. If you can stand, if you can't, that's okay. Remain seated. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Father God, we come to you and we are, we are just people, average and with our faults and our weaknesses and our strengths as well. But we want to be more than that. We want to be extraordinary for you. We would like to have an extraordinary relationship with Jesus. We would like to be different than the rest of this world is, Lord. That's why everybody came up and that's why people stood up today because we all sense the need in our heart uh, for change and for something better. Uh, Satan is working very hard, Lord, in this world, very, very hard. I mean, 24-7, when we are sleeping, he's working. And this world needs a group of people that are going to uh, spread the love of Jesus wherever they go. People who will not get offended when somebody is mean at them. People who are going to smile at those who persecute them. People who are going to do good to their enemies. People who are going to be quick to forgive and who are going to be slow to anger and hate. That's what we want to be, Jesus, in this church, in this church family. That's what we want to be when we meet the rest of our, our family and friends who don't know Jesus. Lord, help us to speak to people through our actions. Help us to be the kind of people when we come into contact with somebody that they'll immediately feel the love of Jesus in us and through us. Help us to be those kinds of people because those are the extraordinary people. Help us to be like Jesus and the apostles and the pioneers of the early church, you know, who have sacrificed their life and 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 worked for those who were, who were meaning them harm. So help us to be that kind of people. Help us to be a church that makes tremendous difference in this world because we have huge goals, the goals that we cannot accomplish if it were not for your involvement and your help. So Lord, just like the people of Israel, when they walked through the desert, you walked with them, and I ask that now you walk with us, with each one of us, that you forgive us our sins, that you help us to be a true example to our children, kids, here in the church, young people, when they see us, that they see genuine Christianity, not just fake so help us to be different, help us to be extraordinary. Come into our life, God, with your Holy Spirit. And when we walk away from this place, I ask that your overwhelming peace may go with us and that we may face the world with a smile and happiness on our face and joy just because we know how much Jesus loves us and that he walks with us every single day of our lives. So Lord, I want to conclude by praying for those who are suffering. Harold's daughter, uh, 27 years old, very sick today, Lord. I mean, if there is any hope, it's only the miracle that you can perform. And as a church, as people who love Harold and Anessa and their family, and Lee and his wife and their, his family. Lord, we just pray that you intervene in this family's life today. And if it is your will that you bring a healing to her, that she may recover and remain with us uh, for a while yet, Lord. We pray that your will would be done 
in her life. We have many other in, the, in this congregation who are sick and suffering, Lord, and we pray that today you bring uh, healing and rest on this Sabbath day into their, into their lives as well. Lord, without you, we cannot do anything. So we just, uh, we just need you. More than anything else, we need you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may.